thank you for joining us today for this webinar. Um, I'll be covering the geophysical methods that can be used in conjunction with your geology workflows um, to help you enhance targeting and interpretation of your geology. Um, my name is Betty Slakeska and I've worked in mineral exploration uh, for the past 15 or so years in varying roles. Um, I've done acquisition, interpretation and processing array type, different types of data. Um, so currently I'm the Global Product Manager at Datamine and I look after our geophysical solutions and I work a lot with our um, exploration group as well. So our other solutions in our exploration suite. Um, so this presentation should take about 30 to 40 minutes. Um, the questions, there will be a QA and a at the end so you can um, ask questions then or you can post them in the chat or you can email us at a later stage should you wish to do that. Oops. Okay, so I'll get started. Um, so geophysics is allows us to map the physical properties of the earth, basically. <laughs> um, there are several methods and I believe it can complement geology, geochemistry and drilling and can generally be a more cost effective way to cover large areas to aid discovery. There are six common used geophysical techniques in mineral exploration, and you can see them on the table there. Um, I'm going to cover only three of them, which are probably the most common um, data types you can find. Uh, I will also use a lot of data that is freely accessible, uh, mainly in Australia, and you can access that through Geoscience Australia or through some of the other. Um, organizations. Um, so geophysics techniques do two key things with the context to um, the physical properties. They can assist with geological map mapping or they can detect targets directly. Um, and you can see there's varying uh, types of commodities, especially uh, interested people that are interested in different areas of the world. Um, they can be done airborne, which covers very large areas, um, thousands of kilometres, and they can, or they can be done on the ground. Um, they can be done air, um, downhole as well, but I'm not covering the borehole methods in this presentation. So as you can see by the table, um, the method and the data types you use are highly dependent on the geological environment and require physical or chemical properties to differ significantly. So in order to be able to de detect a target, um, you need to be able to distinguish the target from its surrounding geology. So the principal properties that we focus on in magnetics, it's susceptibility in electromagnetics, it's conductivity in the electric um, methods, it's chargeability um, in the gravity method, it's density in the radiometric method, it's radioactivity and in the seismic method, it's seismic velocity. And sometimes the commodity or target has a physical property that allows direct detection. So, for example, in lead zinc deposits, um, they have large densities that may be detected directly by gravity. Um, but more often, as a case in base metal deposits, they're discovered when the physical property is associated with another non economic mineral. So, for example, um, copper rich volcanic acid sulfide deposits is targeted um, based on a strong magnetic anomaly that's produced by pyrotype. So a lot of what you're relying on is the rock type having a different property or a signature to the surrounding area for detection. So I'm going to jump into the magnetic methods um, and I did say I'll using data that was freely available. So this this wonderful image is the total magnetic intensity map of all of Australia. So it's varying resolution. And when I say resolution, I mean the grid spacing or the station spacing is highly variable. Um, so this one you can download from Geoscience Australia, but the state governments as well have a lot of um, better resolution data maybe. Um, so if you have an area, you can generally um, select your um, projection information and download these as a geotiff or a grid or use as a WMS directly from um, some of your applications. So the effectiveness of this method um, depends highly 
on the presence of magnetite in rocks and also other magnetic materials such as pyrotite and hematite within the rock properties. So the, mag the magnetic survey will detect these metallic ore bodies and then you can delineate and associate anomalies which can be positive and intense and generally appear as bright spots so when you get these lovely anomalies there. Um, I've just got a grayscale image here as well so this is the same the same data but displayed as a grayscale image. Um, so this one you can see um, shows better the structure so another objective is to determine the trends or extents and geometries um, of, of magnetic bodies um, in an area and to just be able to delineate different geologies. So really useful technique when you don't have any outcrop and you need to cover large areas and potentially look for targets. So just a little bit of theory. I didn't, don't want to go too, into too much detail on the theory of the magnetic method, but so magnetic survey uh, measures the intensity and strength of the Earth's total magnetic field in nanotesla. The intensity of the field varies depending on where you are in the world. So you've probably seen the maps, the total field um, is can be varied by several hundreds of Teslas. Um, and the total field includes both contributions from the Earth's core and the Earth's crust. So commonly, the component of the field from the Earth's core is called the International Geomagnetic Reference Datum, or the IGRF. And in um, geophysical studies of magnetic data, you generally subtract this from the total field and you get the resultant field. So this one should be just containing information from your source rocks. So negative anomalies can also occur um, based on where you are in the world. So high magnetic latitudes, such as within you know, Canada, um, you can get negative anomalies on some of your magnetic maps. So something to be aware of. Um, also, the presence of remnant magnetization, so magnetization from a long time ago or if rocks have moved, um, can also generate negative anomalies. Um, so these ones, there's, you know, there's a whole field of information about remnants and anisotropy. So again, something to be aware of if you're trying to read your data directly from a magnetic map. So like the Earth's field, um, rock bodies are also dipolar as well. Um, so in, in terms that have a positive and a negative part, and this makes them asymmetric. Um, and depending on the orientation of the Earth's field, um, your actual anomaly also may not be centered over a target. So just in like in the second image, you can see, depending on which way your Earth's field is, your anomaly could be slightly off. So there are corrections in geophysics for all of this. Um, and just something to be aware of when you're looking at different data. So you can get um, reduced to the pole or reduced to the equator type um, corrections, which will put your anomaly over its exact source. So, um, you know, having said all of that, assigning a rock type to a specific susceptibility can be really tricky because of the rock types. Uh, overlap highly, <laughs> um, so susceptibility may vary considerably, even with the same rock type. Um, in general, though, sedimentary rocks have a lower susceptibility and igneous rocks have a slight susceptibility. So that difference that I said before, that is how you can distinguish between one or the other. So the most common sources of your um, anomalies in magnetic methods are usually intrabasement anomalies, um, and this is you know, what we're looking for, for due to lithology or magnetization changes in basement rocks. Um, so you can also have super basement anomalies um, and variations in basement topography. Um, they could also be interested in sedimentary anomalies and volcanics and also intrusives and other sedimentary sequences. So paleo channels, um, which contain hematite. So just something to be aware of. Knowing your geology, obviously, is probably the most important thing in order to be able to distinguish um, your anomaly types and what kind of source rock they're coming from. 
So I'm going to cover, um, I'm going to use this example throughout, I think, so um, the Olympic dam, dam example. So um, a very famous discovery, you know, a very profitable discovery for BHP, which was discovered in the 70s. Um, so it pretty much wholly owns its existence to uh, gravity and magnetic methods that were um, that were then acquired by some of the ge well, Geoscience Australia, but what was a different entity at that time. Um, it's a sedimentary copper deposit and it's classed as an iron oxide associated copper, uranium, silver, and even rare earth element deposits. So lots of different commodity types. So the deposit occurs in a hydrothermal breccia complex and it's within a protozoic or mesoprotozoic crystalline basement in the Stewart Shelf in South Australia. And the interesting part about this is if you looked at the geology map on the left, it's pretty much overlaid by, you know, several hundred metres up to three or four hundred metres of sediments or flat lying sediment rocks. And it pretty much has no outcrops or no surface outcrops at all. Um, so the mineralisation within that breccia complex is also predominantly hematite rich, which was helpful when acquiring magnetic data. So as you can see on the total magnetic, so the TMI image on the right, there is a large um, magnetic anomaly over Olympic Dam, as you can see, I've got it labelled there. So the broadband anomaly is due to several geological reasons, but it basically due to the magnetite in the deposit and of the hosting granites. Um, so the deposit was initially detected in magnetic and gravity data um, in 1975 by WMC, Western Mining, and it coincided with drilling and identifying targets within the geological models that they conceptualised at the time based on surrounding areas. Um, so this is a typical type of magnetic data you can get in various parts of Australia. So this one is from the South Australian government. If you go on their website, you can download all of this data and some of the residual data as well. So obviously a lot of studies have been carried out um, in this data. So the, you can see the total um, magnetic intensity image looks, you know, it looks quite nice and you can see there's some other features. But if you want to really bring out some of these magnetic features, you can uh, filter this data as well. And I did that um, in PA Explorer. So um, this image is the first vertical derivative. It's a grayscale because I think you can kind it kind of looks still a little bit too hot in the in the coloured images. So you can see where Olympic Dam is, and um, the first vertical derivative is just one residual um, magnetic image you can create uh, if you filter your data. So they're basically mathematical methods within commercial packages. Um, like I said, I use PA Explorer for this one. Um, you can input your grid and then generate these images. You can also get half vertical or second vertical derivatives of this map, just so, you know, just so you're aware as well. Um, you don't have to go for the first. So when I, when I talk about the first vertical derivative, it's probably the most common used derivative product. Um, out of a TMI magnetic map. And it's basically a vertical gradient of um, the data. And it emphasizes, um, as you can see, the near surface geological features. Um, and the gradient anomalies are narrower from the TMI. So the magnetic anomalies produced by um, features, geological features that are closely spaced together, units that are closely spaced together, can be better delineated. So you can see them a lot clearer on this image. Um, so they're also useful. So you can see over that, I've also, over that image, I've also got some fault lines as well. So that were all uh, on there. And you can see that the, fir the first vertical derivative also um, shows a bit of separation between geological contacts. So it coincides with contacts having a magnetic contrast, which is really useful um, when you're trying to uh, map features that could be as a result of um, faulting. So another 
derivative that I want to cover um, is the total gradient of the TMI. Um, now, this one's also known as the analytical signal. I actually probably call it the analytical signal, but the total gradient is probably tells you what it is a bit better. Um, so this is the square root of the sum of the horizontal and vertical gradient of your magnetic vector. Um, and this one basically accentuates more shallow sources. Um, and by shallow, I don't mean, you know, five metres. I mean, like, you know, maybe several hundred metres. Um, and any kind of adjacent sources as well. Uh, so it's effectively mapping the distribution of shallow magnetization, um, and it's also independent of, of um, magnetic direction. So because you're uh, squaring the horizontal and vertical, um, it can be a great source of information. Um, so the next one I've got is the tilt derivative. Now this one, so this one is a ratio of the vertical and horizontal gradient. So you can vary this tilt, the ratio. Um, this one may be a little bit noisy because there's, you know, especially if there's shallow gradients, but it's effective in mapping the local trends, basically, um, especially of thin magnetic sources. Um, so dikes and things. And um, again, it, it really does follow the structure quite well as well. Um, and also what's useful with this one, I've used this one before to um, detect edges as well of anomalies. So you can uh, detect your edges of your, either your lows or your highs, depending on what you select. Um, and if you, if you, I think if you go to the government website, so the South, South Australian government, they do have a lot of these automatically picked um, edge detection of these anomalies. So what's important about these filters as well, uh, which I want to mention, is that mathematically you can use these for um, depth estimates, so so depth to basement estimates as well. So that's just really an important um, note. <laughs> so I'm going to go into gravity methods next. And again, I've got my lovely map of Australia, uh, again from Geoscience Australia. Now, why do we look at gravity? So gravity for geophysics application is primarily used because um, it varies over different rocks and different distances from the centre of the Earth. So gravity can be a little stronger over heavier rocks, as you can see by the diagram, and it's a little weaker over less dense rocks. So in valleys as well, well, I should mention that something very important to know that obviously you're going to get gravity lows um, if you're on top of a mountain and you get gravity highs if you're um, in a valley. So all of these differences are very, very tiny um, and you need a gravity meter to be able to detect them. So they can be, you know, in hundreds of a nanotesla, oh, sorry, of a, <laughs> they can be very, very tiny. Um, so beside the variations in the crustal density, the gravity field is also influenced in things like the latitude um, and position and changes in elevation. Uh, and in order to get the absolute gravity or the, the Bouguer gravity or the Fourier corrected gravity, you do need to uh, do quite, sometimes can be quite complicated um, corrections for gravity from the observed gravity data. So things like earth tides as well need to be removed. Um, all of the elevation factors need to be removed. And you finally get the um, corrected Bouguer or Fourier anomaly. Um, so the one, the image that we do have is the Fourier. I think it's the Fourier anomaly of all of Australia. And what I like about this image the most is you can see the difference between the distribution of older sediments to the west and the newer kind of volcanics which are more dense to the right um, and so ground gravity is very common as an initial exploration technique um, airborne gravity can be a little bit lower in resolution um, but ground gravity can be a little bit more timely and take a lot longer to correct for but it's also uh, highly used in conjunction with other techniques. So um, the most kind of 
important method in determining um, whether a particular EM or electromagnetic anomaly is as a result of highly dense sulfide deposits versus um, less dense graphite deposits, which also cause a, con a high conductivity. So really um, interesting. Um, so I've got an example of a ground survey resolution versus an airborne survey resolution. So you can see like a lot of the more bumps and lumps with the ground gravity versus an airborne survey. Um, so there is also another survey type uh, and it's called gravity radiometry. So the AGG survey that you can see at the end of that. So th that's been in development maybe for the last 15 or so years um, and it's made really considerable improvements in gravity being used for direct detection. So you can have uh, highly accurate data. Um, so just want to show you some images from the different gradient graders you can get. So the um, airborne gravity gradiometry. So again, you can cover quite large areas with this one because it is airborne. Um, so you don't have to immobilize a lot of people and um, you can collect data rapidly. So this method uh, measures the gravity tensor. Uh, so it includes nine different tensors um, and the gravity gradient is along three different orthogonal directions. So it also uses a very sensitive and calibrated gravity gradiometer. Um, so one of the components, the TZZ in this image, is um, quite useful in detecting kind of thin targets or like things like kimberlites as well. So it's very, it's been very useful. Um, also, it's been probably quite useful for pegmatites if you're you know, looking for rare earth elements as well in, of late. Um, the only issue with, I guess, gravity gradiometry is the expense. So it can be very expensive. It can be hard to process as well. So you have to have someone who knows exactly what they're doing and the different tenses that they're looking for. Um, and there's at the moment, there's two systems. There may be more, but uh, so the FTG and Falcon are the two that you can use for gravity um, gradiometry. So I'm going to go back to my Olympic Dam example with my um, with my gravity data. So in this one, this is actually a ground gravity uh, compilation from South Australian government, um, and you can see there's probably varying resolution in here. I um, so it's all ground surveys which have been done over varying years with different types of um, processing, and you can definitely distinctly see the Olympic Dam. Um, anomaly there on the data. But what you can also see is there's a few other anomalies. So to the north is um, Coronation Dam, and then down to the south is um, the Acropolis Prospect and also Roxby Downs as well. So the initial program in the 70s, I just, I found this image recently and I thought it was really interesting. So you can see how they didn't have, you know, these nicely shaded images um, these were just gravity and magnetic contours. So you can see the magnetic contours at the top and then the gravity at the bottom. So basically you were looking for things that was close to, bunched in close together. So, and the program in, the drilling program in Olympic Dam was solely based on these types of images. Um, so initially they thought that these anomalies probably were as a result of um, a basement that was maybe up to a thousand meters in depth so that was a refined um and i think they assumed that it was based on basalts or other um types of dense kind of geology that was also occurring in the area um so i'm just gonna flash to so this image now is the bigger gravity um, and it's also a 1VD or a first, first vertical derivative of the gravity. So you can apply derivative data um, to, to your um, gra gravity data as well. And the dark contours are actually your um, TMI. So you can see that. So the interesting thing about these um, images is that gravity and magnetic fields uh, follow the same behaviour. Um, is that the gravity high corresponds to a magnetic high? 
Um, that doesn't happen often. So we know that geologically gravity field variations are depending on the different masses or bulk densities of rock types and then the magnetic field um, are generated by contrast in you know, ferromagnetic minerals. And so having both uh, density and mag magnetization can really help you uh, delineate different features. And, you, and seeing as the geology is very complex, it was really valuable information for um, drilling programs in Olympic Dam. So interesting, I think they have drilled Acropolis as well, but I don't think that has been deemed as economical. So, okay, so the next method, so I find that I'm just going to go to electric electromagnetic methods, and you may have seen these images. So that is an airborne EM survey that can be done on the ground as well. So it has a, the big loop is a receiver and then it has a source as well. So electromagnetic methods. Uh, they use an alternating magnetic alternating magnetic field um, to induce current in the earth, and then that's measured by the big receivers. Uh, so it's time varying, so we call it time domain EM, and it generates a current in anything that's conductive. Uh, so the physical property in electromagnetics is electromagnetic induction, and then it allows us to map the conductivity of the area. So basically, EM methods in mineral exploration, uh, they look for low resistivity or high conductivity um, deposits, so particularly massive sulfide deposits. Um, and the airborne methods can be over vast areas, as I'll show you in my examples. Um, they can basically help with target detection where you can't, you know, very bushy areas where you can't get to um, easily with a ground crew. So the electrical conductor of rocks and mineral deposits, as you can see by the image, also is highly variable. Um, so it's measure, measured in millisiemens per metre. And it can be in, you know, from hundreds of thousands to very, very small. Um, so granite is essentially a non-conductive, whereas a shale um, can be more conductive. And obviously massive sulphides are the most conductive. Um, what, just also water content um, can really increase the conductivity and it can really influence uh, what you think is the conductive. So being aware of any water sources is really important um, when you're looking at the magnitude of conductivity. Um, so different rock types, like I said, in magnetics can have overlapping ranges of conductivity. So, it, you know, determining what it is just by looking at the conductivity model that you you obtain um, can is is quite tricky. So even massive sulfides can overlap with other um, other elements. So I mentioned before, graphite and even um, clay can really throw you off when you're looking for uh, massive sulfide deposits. Um, really important as well, conductive overburden. Um, especially that contains water channels, <laughs> saturated clays can also generate really high uh, magnetic electromagnetic conductivities and um, mask anomalies um, and mask response. So really important, like with other methods, to know what the geology is in the area before you um, start to interpret your maps. Um, so I've got a 2D and a 3D example there. Oops. So. Um, EM methods, <laughs> basically, I, I already mentioned some of this. So they're basically useful con for conductive targets like massive sulfides and sulfides. Um, rocks containing pyrotite as well and v VMH deposits um, as, a, as a direct target detection. Um, but for conductivity contrast with a host rock, you can find paleo channels, so iron ore hosted paleo channels, um, aquifer mapping, uh, salinity mapping and graphite mapping and also nickel laterite mapping where you don't want to use where you don't want to use um, yeah, methods is things like disseminated sulfides um, if there's mineralization like lead zinc deposits um, if there's very thick conductive overburden um, just with that though you can use downhole so this method is quite commonly done, can commonly be done downhole as well. So if you can get through that conductive overburden and get um, EM data downhole, you can really use it for detection. 
Um, so narrow targets as well are really hard to detect with EM because uh, vertical steeply dipping targets are hard to um, are hard to distinguish. Uh, another um, you know perspective issue is if you've got um, conductors like power lines or um, any kind of other conductors in the area. So you really need to be aware of your surroundings when um, trying to interpret this data. So for this example, I did go for a really large government survey. So this uh, Tempest government survey has pretty much, I think they're trying, trying to, as you saw in the image before, sorry, I should have said, um, the image in my previous slide showed the Tempest government surveys, which um, covers maybe like 70% of Australia. Um, so the surveys are in 20 kilometre line spacing, so very, very sparse and large quantities of data. So um, the survey that I'm looking at is the Australian um, WA and Northern Territory survey. So it's in those, those are the lines, as you can see on top of WA. So it's very, very large, 55,000 line kilometres. Um, the red is the area that I um, that I chose to look at because basically it was easier than selecting all of the others. Um, so I, I just want to point out, so this data has vast amount of information. Not only can you get um, just the conductivity depth sections, which is that nice colourful third image from the top, you can also get the B field um, channels that's in the second image, but it also contains uh, magnetic data as well. So along with the uh, EM data, you also get magnetic data. So uh, this one is, uh, this is in PAX4, right? So I've just displayed my um, geology. And you can see uh, if you are covering large areas, uh, it's really useful for target detection as well, just to be able to display all of these side by side. So got all of them here. Um, so the same conductivity depth inversion sections I've also displayed in a in a um, 3D as well, and that middle that moving image is actually just the a clip of the conductivity as well. So that the nice conductivity, and then you can actually use this um, as a wireframe um, if you if you're doing any kind of inversions as well. So inversion with EM data is quite quite common, trying to determine targets. Uh, so this area, as I said, was very, very large, but uh, we did find some higher resolution magnetic data. So I, I trolled through Department of Minerals um, WA and I detected that they did have a few other surveys. So here I've got the uh, I think it's 400 metre resolution. It's really, really hard to see, but I, I wasn't using this one for um, for my anomaly picking. But it's 400 metre line spacing magnetic and radiometric data that's available in that area. Um, so I was really also happy to find a VTEM survey, so an EM survey with 150 metre line spacing. It's called the Eastman VTEM survey. Um, and so I thought, oh, why don't I just, map this one um, so you can see that's the lines over over the conductivity and the geology of the area so it the geology of the area has medium to high grade meta, meta sediments um, and volcanics um, and it also has intrusions of granitoids and land ultramafics and mafic uh, rocks so the ultramafics is what we were looking for uh, and they were known host rocks for zinc and copper. Um, so it was hoped that the VTEM, I guess that's why this was acquired. I think it was acquired in early 2000. Uh, it was hoped that it could uh, determine bedrock conductors. So let's see that. So I then took this VTEM survey and I gridded uh, the EM data. Uh, so the EM data is in array format. When I say array format, it's divided into channels from early to mid to late. Um, depending on your conductor and how strong of a conductor is, it depends on what channels you want to look for. So you can see how it does actually show the ultramafic conductors quite well, especially going towards kind of the mid channels. So the early channels can be quite noisy. 
uh, versus collections. Um, so then I did go one step further here and I did pick some conductors. Um, so down the bottom, I've got my B field displayed as a profile and I've got my same conductivity at the top and you can basically just go through and pick targets. So I did this in PA Explorer. Um, so based on the VTEM, there were numerous anomalies um, that were highlighted as being potential exploration areas of interest. And some of them were close to other base metal mineralization, and some were close to the ultramafic intrusions as well. So I should also say that some of these can also be as a result of um, surface related issues, but probably the, the majority of these ones were uh, bedrock conductors. Again, really important to know your geology in the area. Um, so this one I kind of did, I think, in 2020, and then I left it. And then just before this webinar, I went to search for potentially more data in the area. I thought maybe there'd been some, some drilling, and there has been drilling done in the area. So there was a drilling program done in February this year, and the, so this is just this was just a press release, um, and in that exact area they have uh, detected a platinum group elements. Um, so this is just a geological model of the potential uh, source of the mineralization. So it, it stands quietly, maybe up to 300 meters, uh, with a rather high grade zone. Um, so. I think this hasn't actually been mined yet, so this is just this was just an RC drilling program. Um, they're probably looking for JV partners or anything like that for funding. But yeah, so really interesting um, as a result of that um, VTEM survey, these anomaly targets were deemed uh, worthy enough to drill and they have detected some platinum group elements in the area. <laughs>